Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and Ellis over there. Uh, yeah, real pleasure to be here. So I'm Rue Smith, um, and how this talk came to be? Well, I came visiting two weeks ago to use the uh, the, the, the uh, X-ray microscope that's used in the in the museum here, and somebody mentioned the possibility of a talk, and I said, "Yeah, sure, okay." So, and that's why I'm here. Now, the talk is going to be about 3D X-ray vision uh, technology applied to a really exquisitely preserved Jurassic vampire squid. And I'll also talk about where it lived. So I'm not a paleontologist by background. I'm a sedimentologist. So my academic specialism was the sedimentology of deep water depositional systems. And there's going to be almost nothing about that in this talk. So it's really going to be for fun. Um, I'm not going to be too heavy on the technical details. I'm planning more to go for the inspiration because it's something really beautiful that I'm going to be showing you. So let's start with a question. Ever wondered what's inside a rock? So here in the audience, has anybody held a rock? Ellis has got his hand up immediately and then wondered what is inside. Um, so it's probably not just you. It's probably many of us. And for quite a lot of people, it'll be on the Yorkshire coast. You pick up a concretion and you think, this looks promising, what's inside? And how do you find out normally? Ellis. Yeah. Exactly. Tap it with a geological hammer and you might then use mechanical tools to reveal what you've, what you've got there. Um, so let's look at something from the Yorkshire coast. So normally it will be an ammonite, but every now and again, it'll be something much stranger and much rarer. So you can see my hand for scale here. This is something from near Horska, south of Whitby, from the Jet Rock. Any ideas what that might be? Ellis. It is a kind of vampire squid, but it's not exactly obvious what it is, is it? it, it it's got a flaring shape up towards the top. It's not really very clear what that would have looked like when it was a living animal. So I'm showing you this for a few reasons. So the first thing is we're in the Yorkshire Natural History Museum, so it seems appropriate to start off with something from Yorkshire. The next thing is it's a really good way, a good opportunity to introduce this kind of animal that we're going to be talking about a lot later um, in, in the talk. And the third thing is that there's no X-ray vision at all involved in this. So I can build the story from there. All right. So what kind of animal was that? Ellis very smartly said vampire squid. Now, what we've got here is something called a phylogenetic diagram, an evolutionary tree. So it's somebody's view, the best view on current evidence of the evolutionary history and the relationships between the different types of animals. So what you can see over there, um, well, first of all, notice time going from Cambrian at left all the way to the present at the right across the top. And there's one big group here that starts off over there. And there's the word coleoidia, coleoids. So that's the group of cephalopod mollusks that have no external shell. So they're soft bodied on the outside and they've got some kind of a skeleton on the inside. And the Nautilus up at the top, he's got an external shell. So he's out of that club. And what I want you to look at, there's lots of words there, but there are basically three areas to look at. Up at the top, we have squids and cuttlefish, and they're called decabrachia because those guys have got 10 arms. And then down at the bottom, um, much younger than those, are the octopuses. So those guys have got eight arms, yeah? So they're, those, they're, they're different. And in the middle, you can see I've put two red stars here. So these are the in-betweenies. They look a bit like squid, but they've got eight arms like an octopus. And uh, you can see the lower star, that is the Yorkshire fossil that we just looked at called Lollygosepia. And the other one is the vampiromorph vampire squids. Um, and if you look at uh, the, the presence, you'll see that 
Lots of things have existed in the past and become extinct, but in the present we have lots of squids and cuttlefish, we've got lots of octopuses, but we've only got one of the vampire squids. So that's an introduction to the group of animals that we're going to be look looking at, the in-betweenies, the ones in the middle, the vampire morphs, as they're called. So this is a vampire squid, and they are amazing creatures. You can see it's got blue eyes in the, in the photograph here, taken in the Monterey Canyon, uh, offshore California, 608 meters water depth. Umbari is the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, so the credit is, is to them. So they've, they've got this, this rusty color to them. Um, and there was a question that I was going to ask to all of the youthful people in the audience here, mentioning no names. What is the coolest scientific name of any living animal? Ellis has got his hand up. I, I completely agree with that sentiment. Yeah. So the scientific name for this animal is Vampiratusis infernalis, so the vampire squid from hell. And it's a bit harsh because it's not that threatening. It looks a bit spooky, certainly, but it's not that threatening. And I was thinking, um, it must have been someone with a very vivid imagination that gave that name to this, this poor vampire squid who lives in the, in the deep water. And I went looking online. First of all, I found a very respectable picture of Carl Chun, who was the guy that described the vampire squid in 1903. And then I found this younger photograph of him where you can see the slightly wild eyes and you can see, yes, it is someone with a, a very vivid imagination. So these guys are absolutely incredible in being able to live in water that has almost no oxygen dissolved in it at all, which is very difficult to do. Most creatures will be dead, but they take life very easily. They, um, they're detritivores, so they don't hunt live prey. I think it's the only cephalopod that doesn't eat live prey. So it eats detritus, dead things in the, in the water column. It's got amazing blue blood that's very efficient at, at, um, uh, um, at binding and releasing oxygen. So it's an incredible animal. Now, I'm going to build towards the 3D x-ray vision in the title of the talk. And what came before 3D X-ray vision was 2D X-ray vision. So that's got a quite a long history in, uh, in paleontology. And it began at the end of 1895 when a guy called Röntgen discovered X-rays. And within a year from that discovery, geologists were already trying out that new technique to see through rocks and see what was in, inside the rocks. Um, so, this is going to be a little story about my first encounter with 2D X-ray vision. And that was about a third of a century ago. It was in Germany. I went with my friend, Peter Hohenstein, uh, to a local hospital, to their radiology department. And we took with us a few slabs of roofing slate, something called the Hunsruck slate, from a quarry nearby the little town of Bundenbach. We also took a large box of chocolates because it was their, their lunch break. So where the patient goes, we put the rocks and took some images. And I'm going to show you just a couple of examples. So here, this is one of those X radiographs that we took in the hospital. At the top, you can see something like a starfish. It's a, it's a brittle star. So its arms are all curled up. And it's like a starfish, but a, but a different group, ophiroid or brittle star. And they have long, wispy arms. Uh, but that was exposed at the surface on that slab of roofing slate. But if you look down here, do you see something else there in that image? What does it look like? It looks like a tarantula with like a spike. Okay, so that, that is really good thinking. So it looks like an arthropod of some kind. So let me show you. So when you actually, when you see something like that, you think, okay, I didn't know that was there. But now I can prepare it out in full vision, or full understanding of what's going to be there. And this is what it looks like today. Isn't that incredible? There's something called Mimetaster hexagonalis. It's from the Lower Devonian. 
but that's one of the most beautiful arthropod fossils that I, I have ever seen. So lots of incredible details on, on the legs that you were, you were noticing. So that's one. And this is published in the British Journal of Radiology by Hohenstein in, in 2004. That is, that's my friend Peter, Peter Hohenstein. It's really fascinating and a very useful technique. No clue at all on the outside of that rock that there was something like that inside. Now, I'm just going to show you the, one more example, and then we're going to move on to the, the vampire squids. So this looks pretty interesting, doesn't it? So from tip to tip of its arms, it's 37 centimetres, something like 15 inches. So it's a big animal. And you can see it's got legs. You can see it's got arms with hooks. And you can see it's got these massive chelicerae in the middle. So you can just picture that pulling in its prey up towards those chelicerae where, where it would chop up the prey. And there it is on the X-ray, on the X-radiograph image. And here it is after preparation. So I've zoomed in now. The, the extents of the arms are off the edge of the picture. But you can see up here the giant chelicerae. These are pedipalps, hairy legs. That's its abdomen coming through there like that. So what is that? Anybody? Ellis, again. Okay, that is a really good effort. So the spider bit is completely correct. So it is a huge sea spider, something called a pycnogonid. And the guy that named it called it Paleoisopus problematicus, because he was a bit confused about what it was. And in fact, this, the, this person, Broily, he uh, reconstructed it back to front. So he thought that the, the abdomen was the head, and he thought that the chelicery up there, that was his abdomen. Um, so, and he made this beautiful picture showing sea spiders like this um, attacking crinoids with their tail ends. <laughs> so, and it's not the only time that an extinct creature has been reconstructed either back to front or upside down. <laughs> Simon Conway Morris, <laughs> but some people will know. Um, so really, really beautiful. Anyway, that was an interlude. That was a step towards the 3D vision that we're going to be talking about. So this was 2D vision, used for a long time, fantastically helpful in seeing what's inside the rock before you expose it. 3D X-ray vision. So the last time I talked about what I'm gonna show you, was last November at a museum open day in Kuala Lumpur. And here you can see the crowd. It was really packed, organized by the energetic Dr. Arindam Chakraborty. This is my 3D printer in the front here because we, we had a little station where the kids were making crystal models and printing them out then uh, as souvenirs. Um, so it's quite funny because it, there are parallels between the museum there in Kuala Lumpur and the museum here. So in that museum, you can walk out the door from the lecture room, you can walk across a courtyard, you can walk down a corridor, and you will find uh, a gentleman I'll introduce to you in a, in a moment with an X-ray microscope. And the same is true here. So in the museum here, you go down the stairs from where we are, out onto the road, along the road, into a, a building, and that's where the X-ray microscope that's used down here, um, it can be found. Uh, not everything is similar. So there the climate is humid tropical and here uh, a little bit less warm, especially at, at this time of year. So what I told this crowd was that, that I have always loved museums since I was a child, since I was a small child, because you have fascinating objects and they are arranged and displayed to inspire and to educate. And then I said to them, but there's another aspect of museums that's super, super interesting. And that's the research that goes on behind the scenes. And that's what this is all about now. So I mentioned going down the corridor and finding this gentleman. So this is Dr. Hijaz Kamal. And he has an equivalent here in Sheffield, he's yeah. Jake Keane. And you can see that he's, he's standing there um, in front of this machine. It's a Zeiss machine. It's a big box. You can see that there's a radiation warning there in Malay. And we can look inside. There's a window for that machine so we can peer inside and see what's going on. So there are three things here. So in the middle is a table that goes round and round and round and round and round. And that's where we put the specimen. 
Over on this side, we direct a beam of X-rays at the specimen. On this side, we have a detector. So the way it works is, while that beam of X-rays is going, is aimed at the, the rock, as it goes around, so the beam of X-rays, it goes into the rock, and if it finds something which is denser than the rock, then it becomes attenuated, it loses intensity. And then at the other side, the detector then records if that X-ray beam was not slowed down at all, not, not, not attenuated at all, or if, well, or, or if it did, if it found something higher density. And then as the thing goes around, we get a record in every single orientation, and then the specimen also goes vertically. So when it's finished, every single point in that rock has been touched by the, the X-ray beam, has ex experienced the X-ray beam. And then software puts it all together, and it makes a stack of slices. Uh, and the, you know, the, those slices are often very, very high resolution. So it, it, it might be a, a tiny fraction of a millimeter, each, the difference between each one of, one of those layers. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So that's how you make the 3D images. Um, and the machine here is, is similar. It's a bit, got a bit of a bigger space here. It's a different make, but that's the principle. So let's have a look at something. Now, here is a fossil, and it maybe doesn't look that spectacular. It's a gray rock about the size of my hand. And you can see that there's a fossil there, can't you? Can you see it's got like a torpedo shape at that end, and it has some arms at the other end. So you think, all right, this is pretty special because it's like the vampire squid fossil that we saw at the beginning that, that Ellis so correctly identified. But it's got all of the soft parts. It's got all of the body and it's got all of, all of the tentacles. So not, they're not tentacles here, they're arms in, in these particular animals. And it's in a rock and it doesn't look that exciting. It's obviously something pretty special. But now with the 3D X-ray vision technique that we've got, um, we can look inside. The picture on the left is one of the things that you see very quickly. So now we are looking at an image. And the, so the light color there in, in that display is everywhere there was a higher density in, in the rock. So it's picked out all of the pyrites in the, in the rock. So that's, that fossil we just looked at is made of pyrite, iron disulfide, fool's gold. Um, and we can't see that much, but we're looking from inside the rock now. Uh, and we're looking at the other side of that fossil. But already we see something interesting. So you can probably see there's a shape like that. Do you remember on the other side, the arms are quite nice and organized and a little radiating pattern. Here, you can see one of those arms is much longer. And there's another one over the top there that, that's folded, folded around over there. So it's actually got two arms that are longer than the other arms. So that's pretty interesting. And there are some shapes there that we can see that, that are where the gladius, the thing that we saw from the Yorkshire coast, is just pressed against the outside of the fossil. So often you'll see um, renders of 3D objects in rock like that. And that's the easy bit. So you just pick out the big density contrast. What I've done on the right, though, is something very different. So I use software called Drishti, which I believe means vision in Sanskrit, written by A.J. LeMay from the Australian National University. And that software gives you very sophisticated control over all the different interfaces, density interfaces. So you can choose how uh, transparent or opaque they display, uh, uh, and uh, you can choose the color. And what you're seeing now is that I'm looking at what's inside that pyrotized fossil. So there are, there are things inside. It looks like it's a solid mass of pyrite, that fossil. But actually, there are other objects inside which are not pyrotized, so they're not so dense. And controlling how each of the interfaces is displayed. We look inside right now, and you can see there are elongate features there in the mantle of the animal. Uh, and there are things in here. You see that structure? There's another one over, over here. That's cartilage. That's the cartilage that goes around the eyes. It's incredible detail. And what's really special, and you can't see it very well here, but we're going to look at it in a lot more detail. You can maybe see that there's something down there, down there near where a mouth would be. And those are the beaks. So we're going to look at those in more detail. And then looking at individual arms, you can pick out suckers. 
Um, all right. So when I saw that image, I mean, it's one of the first things that you do when you get a data set, you just go for a browse. So you'll, you'll um, look at the slices, just browse through, and then you'll play with these controls uh, using something called transfer functions to highlight what, what looks interesting. So with the default blue background and with that transparency, I thought that looks alive. I can really picture that alive. And it reminded me of this a picture at the top right, that's a jellyfish that's on a night dive off Sulawesi in Indonesia. And this is what it reminded me of. And it looks very tranquil, that photo. But in fact, I've got a torch in my left hand. I've got a camera in my right hand. I'm trying to angle the torch to light up the thing. I'm trying to focus with the camera. And the colleagues of, of this jellyfish are stinging me at the same time. And everything's moving. So that's the end result. That was the only photo I got. So worth it. But uh, yeah. That I think is what that's that's like a joy in paleontology, isn't it? You look at some long extinct creature from about 164 million years ago, and you look at it and you think that looks alive. Right. So now we're zooming in. We're zooming in big time. So what I'm doing here is I'm showing off my virtual microsurgery skills. And if you look at the top left, there's quite a lot here. So we'll just take it block by block. We're looking right at the front of the animal. So you can see the arms radiating away, and there's one arm that's folded over from right to left. And you can see that there's a, a little feature in the yellow box. So what I've done is I've gone in and I've cut out that yellow box, three millimeters by two millimeters. So it's a very small scale. And in the computer, I've gone in and I've said, chop, 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 chop. And then looking at that in detail, you can see that there are two points of the beaks so a vampire squid, like, like the cuttlefish and, uh, and, and like octopus, they've got beaks at the front. Um, so there they are on the outside. And in these images, what I'm doing is I'm going onto the inside. So now we're looking from the inside of that fossil outwards. <coughs> and so these points are now on the outside. But can you see this feature? There's something there that's kind of aimed like a, like a a point's going down, a kind of crest, and there's something else down there. So that seems remarkable. We're inside a body of solid pyrite, but I've displayed it such that we can see the things that are not pyrite, and they are beautifully preserved beaks in situ. Um, and I've labeled it here up at the top. So one of the things you can do in the software, of course, is you can put a dot there and a dot there and make very precise measurements. So 2.45 millimeters, and here I've labeled it upper beak, lower beak, wings, very special radular cartilage over here. And I've got printed out versions of, of these, which I'll pass around um, in a moment, but I've never seen that before. I think these are unique observations in fossil cephalopods. Beak, uh, the radular cartilage that would have supported tiny rows of teeth in what's called the buccal mass in, in the mouth area of this uh, of this vampire squid. And down at the bottom, so those, those colors are now transferred and you can see a top beak, a lower beak, which is broader. So it's much pointier, isn't it, the, the top beak. And that's comparing it with uh, a modern one, dissected. Uh, this is from a paper in 2022 by Rostian et al. You can see the difference. So she's shown it open, her pair of beaks, and our vampire squid has got them closed in situ. So we've gone inside the animal and we've seen its beaks still in the correct position, not squashed, completely three-dimensional. It's remarkable. Now, as you interpret, you can code different parts of the volume. So you can, it's called painting or segmenting. So you can say, all right, that bit's the beak. I'm going to uh, extract that little bit and give it a, give it a code. Uh, and that's what I'm showing here. So the head and the mantle, or the, what I call the body there, that's all in red. And I'm using loads of transparency here so you can actually see through and see what's inside. In yellow is cartilage. And each of those in three dimensions is a, is a beautiful disc around each of the eyes. And the beaks that we've just been looking at, those are shown in blue. And then the arms in pink out in the front. Um, and they're, they're actually the, the, the other two over the top, but they're so transparent you can't really see. So that's all just 
plucked out of, of the gray rock that we, we saw at the beginning. Now, if you can code the different volumes, you can print them. Uh, and I was delighted with this. I couldn't do this a year ago, um, but I thought, I've got, I've got the data now. I, uh, I can print it out. So I bought a, a very small 3D printer, the one that you saw earlier in that picture in Kuala Lumpur. And right here is the whole vampire squid, um, just freshly printed out with all of its support. And I brought these along in a, a couple of different scales. So there it is. Three dimensions just plucked from the rock. Seems kind of incredible. I mean, the novelty's worn off a little bit now, but, but something really remarkable. And also very, very, yeah, again, wonderful. Uh, so these are the jaws, the beaks. And that's the radular cartilage that goes behind. So remember the... Original one is two and a half millimeters from there to there. But when you print something out, you can scale it up to whatever size you want. You can print it out. And now I can turn it around. You know, you can see what it looks like. Um, really lovely. Uh, oh, and there they are. <laughs> so, yeah. I could have pointed at the screen then, couldn't I? But, but it's kind of nicer with the, with the actual things. So this, again, was one of those points where I thought, this looks alive because this really looks looks alive and it's obviously white so it would, would have been alice could color it some nice rusty color maybe um but this reminded me of uh my pet cuttlefish because i used to keep a keep a marine aquarium in oman quite a few years ago and here he, here he is ramses is called sepia pharaonis and there are differences so he's a cuttlefish um so he's got 10 arm 10 limbs i should say so he's actually got eight arms and two tentacles. Um, he's got a very distinct boundary between the mantle and, and the head, different on the inside. He's got a cuttle bone inside. He's got fins all the way around the side, whereas, whereas this guy actually got little tiny fins at the back that are, that are folded in against the body. So lots of differences, but about, this is about the same size as, as Ramses, not, not a very big cuttlefish. Um, and if you go to a search engine and you put in two words, if you put in Ramses, and Tonmo, then you will find a whole series of videos showing that animal communicating in different colors and different textures, uh, camouflage skills. Uh, a really funny one where he fails to catch the crab and he flashes these really angry black spots all over his body until he's got over it. So something else about um, printing, printing the, the, the models out, if, if you like. So it seems like human brains vary a lot in how they can visualize in three dimensions. But we all see, I think, pretty much the same when, when you've got a solid object like that. So all I'm showing here is I've printed out, and that's the, the dorsal view with, with the long arms. Um, I printed it out, and then, and then I go really low tech. So I think, OK, so now I can see it big in my hands. I can turn it around. I can see different angles of, of shade. I can now think about it and dis decide what I can interpret, decide what I'm not very sure about that might send me back into the data to solve some questions. Yeah, so that's a really helpful aspect of printing out the things that you segmented in the, in the 3D data set. And what I probably didn't mention was, I always assumed that we were looking at the top of the animal like that in, in the rock. But as soon as we looked at and saw these long arms, and we saw the beak where we can clearly see which is the upper beak and the lower beak. All that, all the you know, past 20 years, I had it upside down. So this is the right way up. Um, it just landed that way, that, that way up in, in, in the sediment. So already, you know, quite big, big revelations. Now, I'm a sedimentologist, so I want to know about the context uh, of, of the fossil, not just the fossil. The fossil is very, very cool indeed. And unique in many regards. But if you look sideways on, and I'm using an orthographic projection so that I can effectively stack up from front to back all the different features. Here is our vampire squid, Vampiranassa rodanica, and it's an orientation like that. And each of these yellow colors is pyrite, more of that iron disulfide. And what I've shown on the right is a polished section on one side of the, the rock. And what you can see is 
there are lots of thin layers, really thin layers, laminae, yeah? And they're not disrupted. So that gives us a really important clue. It tells us that the bottom waters here were anoxic. There was no oxygen there. There was nothing that was around that could biotubate, could dig in and disrupt all of those, those laminations. And I've just put a little O here, so we'll come to that in a moment. There's something else quite interesting just beneath the vampire squid. Important clue um, and well worth looking at. So when you've got that rock, you saw the rock at the beginning, didn't you? So it was just a gray rock with the vampire squid, the vampire anassa sitting on the top. When you've got a computer tomography data search, you can go exploring further in the rock, just like we saw with that, that amazing arthropod from the Hunsruck slate in Germany. So if I look a bit deeper in the rock, I see this. And nothing of this is exposed on the surface. It's a complete surprise. But can you see what they are? Five arm things. Alice. Correct. Or nearly correct. So they look like starfish, but once again, it's that animal that we said looks like a starfish, but it's got these long, wispy arms. A brittle star or an ophiroid. So that's what, what, that, what that is called. They can be quite interesting when you, when you see them underwater because you'll see a wispy arm over here waving at you and then another one over on the other side of the rock. So both are kinoderms, both, both related, but, but different, different groups of animals. But I'll take starfish. And the nice thing here is we've got a complete 3D data set so we can look at all of them, we can count them all up. And when you do that, so you count up how many starf brittle stars, <laughs> <laughs> we see in, in the rock, we can work out what's the density of them. And the, hiding behind the dinosaur's tail is a scale of a centimeter down here. So they're pretty small. And if you do the maths, you end up with an incredible number, 14,000 of them, more than 14,000 actually, per square meter. And that would be if, as you scaled it up, as, as you went to a whole meter squared, there was the same density of brittle stars. Now, nobody's ever seen that concentration before. But what's really interesting, given that previous slide where we saw the sediment with all the laminations, in the modern oceans, when you look at the boundaries uh, of oxygen minimum zones, so this is in the seawater, so the top part's full of oxygen, lots of dissolved oxygen. And as you go deeper, uh, oxygen gets used up as falling organic matter is oxidized. And then there's a, very often there's a body of water, it's usually between about 100 meters and 1500 meters, where there's no oxygen or very little oxygen. Um, so at those boundaries on the modern seafloor, from photographs, you can see incredibly dense concentrations of brittle stars, the very same animal, the ophiroid. Yeah. So that matches, and that's really interesting. Um, and the other thing you can see is that the, the arms aren't all pointing one way, so they've not been caught up in a current, uh, which is what you do see in, in that German roofing slate. So they've just, they're happily, they're, they're on the bottom there, uh, and they're also not disarticulated. They haven't fallen to pieces at, at all, which normally they do, because they, they're made of little tiny, tiny you know, uh, bits of calcite, basically. Um, so they have just, they were living there, and then they have died, and then they've been turned to pyrite very, very quickly before they could disarticulate. So lots of really great clues. And this is looking from above now. We're just seeing all everything that's pyrite all at once. So you can see there's the vampire squid. Underneath it are all those opioids. And these are concretions. These are little um, just nodules of pyrite. Right. So. Um, We've collected quite a lot of evidence so far, haven't we? we, we we've got somewhere that's deep, <coughs> anoxic, concentrations of brittle stars, like we see in the modern oceans at the boundaries of oxygen minimum zones. Um, and there's something else. So this is a reconstruction, an artist's reconstruction of a new one of these animals. It's, you can see the name up there, Lollygosipiid. So it's very closely related to that Yorkshire animal that we talked about at the beginning. And there's a specimen that Oliver curates around the corner in the museum. But there's something else that's 
being seen here. So the paper is by Alison Rowe et al. in 2023. She calls it Vampirofugens atramentum. But in her animal here, the newly described animal, it looks pretty similar to the one I've been showing you with the 3D x-ray vision. It's got little tiny fins at the back. It's got no break between the head and the mantle behind. Um, but you see these little things down here. So in the fossil, it's from, the fossil is from the same place the place called La Volte sur Rhone in, in France. It's got light organs called photophores. So those are bioluminescent little lights. I think you know about that, don't you, Ellis? So the vampire squid, um, we see all the nice pictures where someone's in a remotely operated vehicle and they're shining a light on the vampire squid. Um, but if you didn't shine a light, what you would see are little dots of light from its bioluminescent um, light organs. And hers also has an ink, um, ink stack, which my specimen doesn't. So um, this is very interesting because where do you find animals that have bioluminescence deep in, the, in, a, in a deep water environment? And for anybody that's interested in this group of animals or this technique of using the 3D X-ray vision to look at minute details, I really recommend looking at her papers because she does beautiful work dissecting out tiny details, even like the, the individual suckers on the arms of the, the animals. So really good. And then zooming out, so I'm kind of pulling it all together now. So we're coming to the end. We've collected quite a lot of evidence. Because remember at the beginning I said it was going to be 3D x-ray vision about an exceptionally preserved vampire squid and where it lived. So we've got quite a lot of evidence now for where it lived. Laminated marl, no bioturbation, no indication of currents. So that we could see from the from the sample of the rock, dense concentrations of aphioroids. That we saw uh, when it was in the rock. From Allison's animal, there are vampiromorphs, as they call, with light organs. There are other things in the literature. So sometimes you you can get lots of information from the thing that you work on, but in the literature, people that have worked in the area have got other lines of evidence that you can bring in. So not far away are some very distinctive deep water sponges. There's also a distinctive dim light brachiopod. And then someone has described slumps where the sediment has crumpled as it's moved down the slope or scars where the sediment has gone down the slope. So that's a lot of evidence to play with. This is where, this is a Google Earth image of Southeast France. And this is where our animal comes from, La volte sur Rhone, right on the edge of a basin, of a deep water basin. So what can we interpret? It, was, it ended in the sediment, upper slope, deep water, greater than 200 meters. Oh, there's a word there, mesopelagic. Low light, so dysphotic, hence the use of the, the light organs. Low oxygen levels with fluctuations. So I put anoxic, hypoxic, that's from basically no oxygen just to just a little bit of oxygen. Um, so that means something like if you, if you um, shrink the oxygen minimum zone so that the tip is deeper, you can imagine Oliver the Ophiroid tiptoeing down into deeper water saying, come on, guys, there's food here and I can breathe. But then as soon as the oxygen minimum zone expands and the top becomes shallower, then they're all killed off by asphyxiation. And I think that's probably what we're, what we're, we're actually seeing. Um, edge effect benthos, that was the story about the concentrations of Ophiroid. And then this is something from the literature. Some people have said some of the arthropods that you find there, there there's there are shrimpy things, and there's a crazy looking thing called a thylacocephalon with big arms that is probably a hunter that needed more light. So those, they could, you can always have things from shallower in the water column that fall to the, to the depth. Um, and now we're really close to the end. So this is a bit of a narrative, and we can use this for that. So 164 million years ago, a young vampire squid, this guy here, swimming along, fell to the deep, dark, anoxic seafloor. And he turned as he fell. So what happened was then that the, the longer arms that there were on top are now underneath, and they're a bit crumpled up under the head. And the arms that were below are now splayed out on the sediment surface. And there was nobody there to scavenge. There wasn't enough oxygen to support any scavengers. But somehow it turned into pyrites, didn't it? Very quickly indeed. And the way that happens is in those anoxic conditions with no oxygen, 
there's a different kind of bacteria that goes to work called sulfur reducing bacteria. So they reduce the sulfate that's in the seawater into hydrogen sulfide. And that reacts with iron that's present in the, in the sediment you know, and, and dissolved also in, in the sediment. And that precipitates out the pyrite very quickly. Uh, and what's incredible with this one is that that happened while the animal was not squashed still, while it was still completely 3D. Because the animals that Allison has worked on are beautifully preserved, but they're all squashed flat. So this one is really exceptional. And, so, and there he is. And this is to summarize what we've seen. So we started off, I'm using, the, I'm using it as a pointer now. <laughs> we started off with that gladius, so the internal structure in a Yorkshire vampire squid, or nearly a vampire squid, not a gasepia. And then we went to France after learning about how you make these 3D X-ray vision images. And we, we, now we've got something which has got arms and mantle preserved. And then we get clever with how we display the data and we can look inside the pyrite and see beaks and cartilage and elongate structures in the mantle. And then we saw how you can um, label each of those different components. And then we saw how you can print them out. And then what I hope I've done today is made it, make it live for you. Because you look at that first image, and it's really hard to see uh, what kind of an animal that was. But by the time we've got to here and here, then we start to uh, recognize that it's a, an animal like my, my friend, Ramses. This is now just a, a little slide to say the technique is very powerful and we use it on lots of other projects. So this is a trilobite with antennae and limbs. There are a couple of incredible cases of symbiosis in amber. So this is a, a lady ant with her wings carrying a little mealy bug to start a new colony because she farms those until it ended sadly with a splat into some tree resin. And then these pink things are hitchhiking or stowaway nematodes who climbed onto the beetle just for a ride to go somewhere else. And then with this technique, technique we can actually look under the wing covers of the beetle. And at the top is a crystal with a little trail, a fiber of fluid inclusions. And there's a model made of that showing you know, what's the orientation of that fiber relative to the, um, the crystal crystallographic axes. So the technique is incredibly powerful. You've just got to turn up with a question about something that you can't see with your eyes. Uh, and you, when you're reluctant to go and damage the object by hitting it or, or polishing it, this technique is absolutely wonderful. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. And the Brilliant answers from, from Ellis. And I'm curious to see where you want to go with the question.